Hi. So in this little lecture, we're going to talk about using the laws of large numbers for a more non-trivial example, one in which we have to think about what the laws of large numbers really means and using Chebyshev's inequality at quantities, which are not just as simple as the quantities we're usually interested in when we look at polling type questions. So the example we're going to look at is er erasure correcting codes. Those are the things we've seen before, these Reed-Solomon constructions, in which we take a message encoded as a polynomial, and then take that polynomial and represent it by its evaluations at many, many points. Then the idea is that although some points might be erased, if the receiver can get enough non-erased points, then it's able to reconstruct the polynomial, and hence the message that was embedded in the polynomial. So let's just make sure we all understand what the order of things is. So we have k messages, which get turned into a degree k minus 1 polynomial that gets turned into a code word by evaluating at, say, n points. Now, the idea here is, suppose we have a probabilistic model of the erasure process. Namely, we believe that on average, if we transmit these n packets, on average, np of them are erased, and n times 1 minus p are not erased. Now, this is the behavior on average. What we want to know is, well, there's going to be some fluctuation around that average. So to think about it, if here's the number of non-erased packets, the histogram is going to look something like this, where here, the mean is going to be at n times 1 minus p. So this is the number of non-erased. So these are the non-erased packets, and we have a histogram like this. So what are we interested in? Well, what we're interested in is how big of a message can we fit? Namely, how many of these messages, what, what size k can we actually have? So at one level, you could say, well, it doesn't really matter. We could carry out this procedure no matter what k is. But that's not the point. The point is we want to understand when will such a procedure actually be successful. So for it to be successful, what do we need to know? We know that k has to be less than or equal to the number of non-erased packets. Now, this thing, the number of non-erased packets, right, this is random. So whether this is true or not is also random. So we would like this to be true often. Want success, say, 99% of the time. So success here means successful decoding, and 99% of the time means we transmit n packets, we get what we get. More than 99% of the time, what we get is more than enough to be able to decode that message. So let's model this. We want to find this k. So what is k? This is the question. So let's come over here and look at this picture. Where would k be on this picture? Well, let's look at think about what's going on here. This is the mean value. Well, that means roughly half the time, the number of non-erased packets is more than this. And roughly half the time, the number of non-erased packets is less than this. So just using this as k is not really safe. Even though on average, n times 1 minus p are not erased, that's not really a safe bet. So where should k be? Should it be on this side, greater than n times 1 minus p? Well, the answer is no, right? Because that means it's even more likely for there to be less. Well, if you want 99% of the time, 
for k to be less than the number of non-raised packets means that k has to be chosen somewhere here. So that this entire area here is 99%, or this entire area here, you know, we want this to be less than 1%, you know, something like that. That's what we'd like to do. You know, where the area here I'm just using as a representation of the probability on that side, you know, counting up all these little points in the histogram. So how do we do it? Well, we need to make a mathematical model. So we're going to start by defining x. xi as a random variable, which is 1 if ith packet not erased, and 0 if erased. Then we can say define y as the sum from i equals 1 to n of the xi's. So now y represents the quantity we want, the number of non-erased packets. So what we would like to have is the probability of y being less than k to be less than or equal to 1%. So how do we do this? How do we go about finding a k that's safe enough to do this? Well, one thing we can do is to start writing out inequalities and try to get this in the form of Chebyshev's inequality. But the problem is, Chebyshev's inequality doesn't talk about these sums and these k thresholds by itself. It talks about averages and deviations from the mean. So let's come back and look at the picture. This is the mean. What the kind of things that Chebyshev's inequality bounds are probabilities not like this, but like this, where you have both sides. So if this is the mean, and you want k, and what, what Chebyshev's inequality does, it talks about this kind of epsilon gap. So just defining the notation, what do we want? We want epsilon n to be equal to n times 1 minus p minus k. Right, this is what we're doing, right? or alternatively, k is going to end up being n times 1 minus p minus epsilon n. So this is the kind of substitution we want to apply. If we apply that substitution into here, what we will see is that this probability that we want to look at is actually equal to, let's multiply both sides by minus 1, So I just flipped the inequality here. Now I'm going to apply a substitution to get me closer to this. Okay, did you see what I did here? What I did here was I simply said, well, for minus k, if I add n times 1 minus p to both sides of this, I will get this. Now this is just this side here over here of uh, Chebyshev's inequality. We need to add the other side in, and we need to change this less than to a less than equal to to make it match up with Chebyshev's inequality. So we can clearly do this. This is clearly less than or equal to the probability that epsilon n less than or equal to n times 1 minus p minus y. Why is this uh, clearly true? Because We've simply increased the size of this event. By increasing the size of this event, we've only increased the probability, and so we have an upper bound. And we're free to, of course, add in this other tail here, because that's only going to make this bigger. So if you look at this, we now have something which is basically in Chebyshev's inequality form, almost. Okay, notice what happened here? We took this absolute value greater than or equal to, 
as a substitution for this pair of events here. Epsilon n less than or equal to n times 1 minus p minus y, and y minus n times 1 minus p greater than or equal to this. These are both, if you take absolute values, you'll see this is the same as this, as an event. That's why this is an equal to. It's not a less than or equal to. So having done this, we're practically in striking range of uh, Chebyshev's inequality. The only problem is that we have y here, and we want in Chebyshev's inequality is an average. So let's just do that. Let's divide through by n. So here's the average we wanted. And here we have the average here, which is the probability of uh, not erasure. And we just have epsilon. So now we can apply Chebyshev's inequality, which tells us that this entire thing is in fact less than or equal to sigma squared divided by n times epsilon squared. So let's do some substitutions here, because we have things in terms of epsilon n. So maybe we should uh, make this a little bit clearer. So this is going to be p times 1 minus p. And let's multiply top and bottom by n. n divided by n epsilon squared. So we have this expression that says that the probability we're interested in we want this to be less than or equal to 1%, it will certainly suffice to set this to be less than or equal to 1%, or just equal to 1%. So let's do this. Let's set this equal to 1%. So now, what we want to do is to basically solve for k. Remember, our goal is to find a k. But to solve for k, what we're going to do is solve first for epsilon, and then use this formula here to get the k we want. To just do that directly, we simply say, look, if we're going to solve for epsilon here, from here immediately, we can get that epsilon is going to be, right, so take this, bring this over to this side, square root from the square epsilon squared, 100, that's that 100, times p, times 1 minus p, that's these guys here, divided by n which, if you want to think of it, you can bring this 100 out, is 10 square root p 1 minus p divided by n. Or alternatively, epsilon n is going to be 10 square root p 1 minus p n. And if you'd like to say this thing, is what epsilon n is, and this has to equal n 1 minus p minus k. So we can conclude that k equals what? Well, it's going to be, it's going to be an n times 1 minus p. Now if you look at it, you'll see that there's also a kind of n times 1 minus p on this side. So we can actually try to group the terms a little bit make it 1 minus, remember we brought this over the other side, 10. And then we have a square root of p divided by 1 minus p times n, all inside the square root. So let's look at this. We have an answer now. It tells us that k is basically n times 1 minus p the average number of non-erased symbols, except we have to take it down a bit. We have to reduce it to be safe. We have to add a safety margin. And the safety margin, as a proportion, scales down like 1 over square root of n. It's 1 minus 10 square root p over 1 minus p n. So we have a formula. But to understand the effect of this, how important is this effect, let's try an example. So let's suppose the probability of erasure is 1 half. So it's like a fair coin toss that erases every uh, packet. And let's suppose that the packet length for our entire error correcting code is 900. So we're sending 900 packets in our error correcting code. 
some fraction of which, roughly half, are going to be erased. On average, 450 are going to be erased. So what does this say for how many message packets we can encode in this larger 900 packet error correcting code? Well, we just simply evaluate this expression. 10 square root 1 half, 1 half times 900. Well, this is equal to 10 divided by square root of 900. Well, what's the square root of 900? Well, that's clearly 30. One third. So that says we have to take a one third penalty. So instead of 450, the safe K is 300, right? 300 is two thirds of 450. And you can tell this is a substantial effect. According to this analysis, the penalty you have to pay is, is non-trivial. We, we have to deal with it. In the real world, we can tighten up these bounds a bit with stronger bounds. We'll talk about later in the class. But this effect is substantial. Square root of n, which is the dominant term here, is actually there. You do have to pay a penalty like this. So what have we learned from this exercise? We've learned that it's possible to use the laws of large numbers to not just tell how many samples we need, but also how much work we can get done given that we only have a certain amount of samples. Now this example here was error, error correcting codes as applied to erasures. Well, we could do the same analysis for errors, actually. And a similar type of analysis would go through. We could do this analysis also for other problems. We could be that we have n workers, for example, in a crowdsourcing environment. On average, a fraction p of them roughly are successful at doing any work, and the other uh, or are unsuccessful at doing work, and only the others are successful. And we want to understand how much work this crowdsourcing system can do, given that we would like a 99% chance of being successful. So the same exact analysis covers that case. And in fact, many other cases in which we're trying to figure out how much work, wherever however work is measured, can be accomplished by using only n amounts of a random resource.